interesting thing, and I've noticed this throughout my years of doing a lot of counseling with people spiritually, and I've noticed that there's sometimes um, a powerful capacity for contrast to awaken us. So I mean the contrast between awful and challenging and, and, and hard circumstances where you're just like, I can't live this anymore. And then the fact that maybe you've hit the end of you trying every single thing you could possibly do and there's a dead end, there's nowhere to go. That could feel like a desperate situation, but it's actually the closest sometimes that people get to the divine because they finally say, I'm done. And when someone says, I'm done, I can't take this anymore. I'm sick of myself. Now there's a window to another way. And the other way is to just be with yourself. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So now you're 90. 8% of the way there after that meditation, allowing yourself to engage with this experience of breathing in a very deliberate and surrendered way, to let yourself move into an effortless space, to allow yourself just to realize that you can receive at infinitum and you will be happy and joyful on planet earth. So when I say 98% of the way there, the secret of enlightenment, I'm going to give it right up front. I typically start right out with the end in mind is the one who relaxes the most wins. So surprise, surprise. It's not this hard effort filled path. That's something that maybe people have confused and, and thought that this was something that was extraordinary and exceptional, which it actually is given the fact that so few of us know how to relax, to truly deeply relax. So that's what we're going to touch upon tonight. Different ways to approach living that allow for us to naturally sink into our most true and unalterable state of perfection. Now just feel that for a moment. There's a part of you that abides in perfect peace, perfect happiness, perfect alignment with all that is, and it is in a constant state of perfection. And so this isn't something that we strive for and try to attain. This is something that we relax into. Many people say that it's this whole process of, of becoming aware or enlightened is a process of letting go of the ego. Um, I personally believe that as long as we're in a human body on planet Earth, no matter who we are and no matter how advanced of a spirit you might be or a soul or a sage you might be, that as long as we have a body, we have enough of an ego to maintain a perception of separation. That doesn't mean that we're bound to it or bound by it, but it does mean that here I sit on, on my chair in my dining room and I'm talking with you and it appears to be that I'm talking with people who are separate from me. The closest we get to this state of absolute awareness is when we begin to see everyone's best interest as the same as our own. We don't see any difference between what's, what's good for you is good for me, what's good for me is good for you. And the one thing that propels us in life, more than all of the ambitions and the goals and the things that we might have been taught were the way to attain happiness someday, the one thing that propels us is peace. So feel that now within yourself. How often in your day-to-day -day life is peace your number one priority. This is no judgment, no guilt. This is not to, to bring that up in anyone, but it's to, to foster a bit of awareness of where we're going tonight. And so if you allow yourself to wake up in the morning and you have a, a career that you care about or a family that you care about or a partner that you love, and there are priorities involved in that. And often, we prioritize 
maybe other people's what's in other people's best interests, especially if we have small children or a young mom or young father. And we feel that that's entirely appropriate. Yet there is a better way. There is a more effective way and a more peaceable way to go through life and actually a more enlightened way. So I'm going to start out in the beginning in the description for this talk. I said and stated how enlightenment is one of those words that people think all different types of definitions for enlightenment. And they might think that, oh, I had an enlightening experience. I learned something new today. Or up until including, you know, someone sitting on the top of the mountain in, in um, meditation pose and being at one with the light. So there are all these different ideas or, or concepts about enlightenment. And I'm going to mostly be speaking from my own personal firsthand experience, because that's the only way that I approach any topic. And so this is one of those um, topics that I've explored um, really deeply. And, and so I have a lot of different perspectives to bring into this. But the one definition that I would like to use for this is one that I just wrote down in meditation this afternoon. It's constant clarity and persistent peace while feeling infinite love and continual appreciation. So I'm going to say that again. It's constant clarity and persistent peace while feeling infinite love and continual appreciation. There's a second part to this. I can hear that truck going by, so I'm just going to wait one minute until that noise is passed. So constant clarity and persistent peace while feeling infinite love and continual appreciation, awareness of your oneness and the divine, and therefore your unbounded, ever-evolving potential and expansive nature. Now, feel that. I just want you to feel for a moment what that feels like if you were to have constant clarity and persistent peace. Just contrast it now. Again, no judgment or guilt allowed. That does never um, promote any kind of awareness or enlightenment. But this is purely for awareness purposes. Contrast this definition to how you show up in your day-to-day -day life. Constant clarity and persistent peace while feeling infinite love and continual appreciation, aware of your oneness with the divine, and therefore your unbounded, ever-evolving potential and expansive nature. Now, notice I didn't say anything about attainment when I talked about enlightenment just then. This is our truest nature, our ever-evolving potential an expansive nature. We came here to evolve this planet. And when we become aware, we realize that one of the ways we personally and individually evolve this place is by having impulses or desires, thoughts and feelings that we'd like to experience in our lives. And that means that there's a definition that sometimes um, often um, Buddhism might purport this, that it, it, it talks about desire being the root of all um, angst and problems in life. I'm going to counterbalance that and make this much more um, accessible to us because I don't believe as humans that we'll ever not have desire because I truly believe that that's the seed of consciousness that allows for us to evolve this place. So right now on planet Earth, we have lots of things that seem to be tumultuous and even foreboding. And as people who are aware and capable of tapping this unbounded potential, we can then desire the evolution of things that resolve those things. That's our truest infinite nature to come here to anything that we find whatever it is, in a place of absolute appreciation, 
And from that place of appreciation, no matter if it's water pollution or plastics or garbage or global warming or war or pain or, or problems and pandemics, if we come to it connected to the part of us that is all love, but nothing but love, all love with infinite potential and absolute awareness of our greatest capacities, then we're going to look at those very same things that could appear to be overwhelming and problematic. And we're going to see ourselves feeling inspired because that's the natural state of being for our truest nature, our evolved and enlightened self. When we find ourselves inspired, now we have something to do on this planet that we will find meaning in and we will find meaningful. Now, feel how many people are, are, are on this planet that right now wonder, you know, what's the meaning of all this? What's the meaning of life? And they're saying it in a way that they're throwing up their hands. Like, I don't get it. I don't get why I feel like I've been dropped in this place and it's chaotic and it's mayhem. And, and here I am in this place where I don't know how to find contentedness here. I couldn't personally find peace perpetually. If that's the state of enlightenment, how the heck am I ever going to get there when I can turn on the news or I can have a conversation with a neighbor or I can do anything at any time during the day and find chaos or mayhem. Well, this is where miracles come in. On this path that I'm most resonant with personally, I love road signs. I love that there's not this someday going to be out there, you know, carrot on a stick experience that we're trying to attain, but that we actually have access to all day, every day. And I love miracles because what I see them as are the insertions of grace that kind of like wake us up in the moment to the fact that there's something more than just this mundane and very literal existence. There's something more and it comes in on a vertical insertion so that we can't mess with it. That's why miracles are so powerful because we just have to receive them. That's all you do with a miracle, you receive it. So it's an insertion of what already is given. And actually, enlightenment is given. The only thing that makes that not appear to be true is our egoic perception that perceives us as separate from the divine. Herein lies the entire journey. So we're, we've kind of touched upon the the problem that's not even a real problem, we cannot possibly be separate from the divine. That is impossible, an impossible dream. And so we come here to dream a dream where there's enough separation going on, where there's a me and a you and an us and a them. But we come here to do the very one thing that will unite us beyond all differences and beyond all diversities, and that's to love. So feel this, what would it feel like and how could you possibly personally attain a state where you're going to be loving all the time? What would that take for you to be loving all the time? It would take a shift in your identity in who you believe you are. And there are places in A Course in Miracles where it comes flat out in the very beginning, towards the very beginning of a less, the lessons of A Course in Miracles where it says, um, you came here to be the savior of the world. And that is anything but an arrogant thought. Actually, that's the only sane thought you can think in order to maintain a perpetual perspective of peace and enlightenment. So I'm going to just frame this a little bit more again so that you can feel it as much more accessible and much more um, tangible. Touch it, taste it, feel it in your life. So when we come here, we typically think of ourselves as needing to gain or attain things or to get things like um, 
status or recognition or material things that make us feel comfortable, safe, or happy, relationships with others, the good or bad opinions of other people really, really matter to us. And so we believe we come here to attain things when actually the opposite is true. You came here as the light of the world. You came here as a living, breathing miracle. You came here and with your first breath, you became animated by the divine. And that's your reminder all day, every day, that there's this connection to the animating part of us that is invisible, yes. And so we label it spirit, but it's the vast and most profound and important part of us. So we slap on these bodies for a period of time to live out an impossible dream and actually a big joke. It's hysterical to our divine selves that are stay in perpetual peace and absolute awareness of who we are always there is an enlightened part of us it's the light of us it remains perpetually enlightened no matter what we think and it's absolutely aligned with the divine no matter what and so as we move at our day and think we're separate from other people and, and most dramatically separate from the source of us, the more separate we believe ourselves to be, the more we're striving and trying and getting in our own way and stepping on our own toes and we're feeling frustrated and we're feeling anxious and we're feeling all kinds of symptoms of disease and what people call mental illness and, and need some mental health because the most important thing that promotes absolute well-being and complete mental health is when we get out of that perspective that we're separate from the divine. When we allow ourselves to remember that we came here to be the light of the world. Anything but arrogant and the only way to be enlightened. Now, you're going to see and hear and know that there are examples of people who have chosen this as their life's um, purpose and way of being. And typically we regard them as exceptional people, but really they're just sane. And they're living in a state of absolute well-being because all they did was allow themselves to perpetually align with the something more of all of us. And you'll notice that they've been benevolent and they've been kind and they've been patient and they've been beautiful examples of, of just the epitome of, of the best of the best of humanity. And the reason why they're wonderful to be able to see is because we get reminders through them that this is possible for human beings, period. If one person can do it, everyone can do it. And the only thing they did is get themselves in alignment with an experience that was different from the normal orientation of seeing with two eyes and hearing with two ears and using your six, your five senses to navigate the world. And instead, they allowed themselves to abide in the spaciousness, the same place that we began with, with the meditation, just breathing. This is not something to attain. Remember, this is a given. And the one who relaxes the most wins. One of the best forms of relaxation is meditation. If you can get yourself into a place with consistency, where you decide that you're going to notice nothing. <laughs> so it might be a sound in the room that's a drone in the background. I have a refrigerator sometimes that comes on and off and I hear that noise, or there might be a clock, or there might be, you know, if you have a metronome, an old metronome, those are great because there's a rhythm to it, but it's not interesting enough to get you distracted. It's not a chain of thoughts that's going to take you off on some story. It's it's an experience that you're allowing to happen and appreciating 
and it puts you in a state of presence and appreciation. And when we're in that place where we're not striving or trying and we're just allowing ourselves to be without beating ourselves up and without having some inner dialogue that we're not enough and we're not good enough and we need to do more, when we just are present with our breath, that we came in with our first breath and we'll leave with our last, the breath is the most powerful way to get in sync with this enlightened self, the relaxed and receiving self. So the part of us that's enlightened and in the light, abides in the light, is the part that's sort of like our, our radar and antenna for the invisible, for the divine. So it is most accurately and, and easily accessed when we do nothing. That's why uh, the graduation statement of A Course in Miracles that I always talk about is I need do nothing. Because the more we can just relax, the more we will access this. Now, there's an interesting thing, and I've noticed this throughout my years of doing a lot of counseling with people spiritually. And I've noticed that there's sometimes um, a powerful capacity for contrast to awaken us. So I mean the contrast between awful and challenging and, and, and hard circumstances where you're just like, I can't live this anymore. And then the fact that maybe you've hit the end of you trying every single thing you could possibly do and there's a dead end, there's nowhere to go. That could feel like a desperate situation, but it's actually the closest sometimes that people get to the divine because they finally say, I'm done. And when someone says, I'm done, I can't take this anymore. I'm sick of myself. Now there's a window to another way. And the other way is to just be with yourself without the criticism, without the need to beat yourself up, just be. And the contrast between that hard like battle with ourselves and then the relaxation of just letting go is sometimes so extreme that all of a sudden it dawns on someone, well, what am I doing that for? What, why on earth am I doing that when there's a possibility and potential for me to just relax my way into a much better state of being? Now feel it and think about this for a moment. What thoughts are going on in your head? Whose voice is it that's telling you you're not good enough? Whose voice is it that tells you that you need to do more or that you're never enough? or that you're not worthy. And notice that sometimes it's us picking up and running with something that we might have heard from a teacher in third or fourth grade or from a parent who was, you know, at, at the time just like frazzled and disconnected themselves. And what is it about us that takes that as law or those perceptions as truth instead of this voice that's always inside of us calling us home to a place of perfect peace in absolute love. It's only, only, only intention is our perfect happiness. And why do we choose that mayhem and the voice that's, that's dismissing us and, and disturbing to us instead of this other voice that's inside of us always that feels until we actually answer the call, it feels like it's calling us home. It feels like it's calling us home. And, and it's a home that we somehow faintly remember, but it's so different than any home that we could live here. We know that. We know that it's fruitless and futile to try to find it here. And, and yet, how come we're so captivated with continuing to try to find it here? We bring it here. That's the only misperception. We don't find it here. We bring it here. So here's the thing that can get a little scary to some people. 
And, and that's one of the reasons why they don't just default to this every morning or every day as the number one priority. It's invisible. It's not tangible. I can't knock on it. I can't touch it. I can't feel it. I can't taste it. I, I don't, if I don't see it, I don't believe it. And the best news about it is it's invisible. So how do you perform? How do you control and manipulate it? How can you do anything that an ego typically does with things? You can't. Try to grab it, try to hold it, try to grasp it, and it's right through your fingers. Try to manipulate it and it's gone. Because it's given and because it's perpetual love. There's nothing to fix or change about it. There's no way to make it, it any better. There's nothing about it that doesn't see you as perfection. It knows you with a capital K. The ego, on the other hand, tries to get you to believe it knows who you are, and it doesn't even know what it is. It's trying all day, every day to have an identity of some kind by grabbing and grasping and, and fighting for or becoming more needy because it doesn't know what it is. So it doesn't have an identity. Whereas our true self, our enlightened self already knows exactly who you are and what its purpose is. And it's very clear and very easy. One word, love. So easy. There's not even a sentence. It's one word, love. You came here as love, to be love, to embody love, to awaken yourself to the fact that all there is is love. And anything else is just um, an exercise in, in nothing, a bunch of nothing. So I'm going to read something to you that I wrote this afternoon, just because fresh out of meditation. And typically when I'm in that space, there's a clarity around this. And this is the secret to enlightenment is what I wrote. And it starts out with that first, with that definition of enlightenment. I'm going to say it one more time so that we realize that this is not this untouchable and confusing concept. This is something that's very clear because it begins with, the definition, constant clarity and persistent peace while feeling infinite love and continual appreciation. Aware of your oneness with the divine and therefore your unbounded, ever-evolving potential and expansive nature. Now feel what it would feel like to be ever-presently aware of your infinite ever evolving potential and expansive nature. That's you, that's you, that's all of us. But the people who we call enlightened masters are the ones who owned it. They just decided to live it. They just decided to do that and nothing else. Because once you realize the, the insane perspective of trying to achieve and do all these things on earth without that connectivity, then you see how hard this is to be human and only human. But when you're a human being, being connected to the divine, then you can show up to life and watch as it's as if a garden is blooming and growing in front of you. All these things mirror and reflect your connectivity. It's like having a hose that you had and you're saying, I don't know what's wrong with this. I can't get any water out of it, but you never hooked it up. I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time here. My garden's dying. Everything's messed up and I don't know what to do. I have this hose. Well, connect it to the source. And then you're going to see how everything begins to blossom and grow. And the only thing you did differently, you can still hold the hose the same way. You can still point it in the same directions. The only thing you did differently was connect. That's all you have to do. And so many of us forget this number one thing, connect. So how do you get to this state, this definition of enlightenment? How do you get this in quotes? By letting go. You get this state of enlightenment by letting go of thoughts that aren't aligned with this. 
by the thoughts that aren't aligned with peace and love and joy and expansion. How? How do you let go of the thoughts that aren't aligned with this? By changing your mind about your purpose. This is the secret, by the way. <laughs> this is what most people won't um, really even get to. So the people who, who have we've labeled as enlightened instead of sporadically aware or enlightened, many people have had moments of lucidity and connectivity. And it might be when all of a sudden they were having an issue with someone and then say they fell ill and you all of a sudden felt compassion instead of separation. And then you were like, what was I thinking? That was a crazy bunch of nothing. And that was an enlightened moment where you chose to join rather than believe in the ego's idea of separation as the be all end all. So think about a time in your life where all of a sudden you chose differently and you chose connectivity. You became one with love, one with the source of you, one with the enlightened being instead of choosing separation. It always feels as though you're elated and joyful and whole. It feels literally like you just came home, that there's nowhere else to be that could be better than this. And those are moments of enlightenment. Now, the only difference between that and people who we label enlightened is that they've had an experience that caused them to perpetually think in alignment rather than in separation. Something significant enough shifted in them that every moment, there's a choice in every moment of if you're going to be separate or connected, each and every one of us, there's only this moment where we choose our experience of life. So each and every one of us, no matter who you are, is going to be choosing one of two things, connectivity, love, or separation, fear. Now, for the most part, we notice in the headlines are all about people choosing separation. That's the stuff that captivates and makes the headlines. But think about how many people you know that you'll see out, you know, watering their garden or playing with the, the neighbor's dog or, you know, doing something kind for someone. In those moments, they are connected. Now you string them one after the other, after the other, after the other, that that's your constant choice that that's your priority, your priority is peace. That's the experience of enlightenment. You're light. You took the, the backpack with full of rocks off your back. Your, your mind is clear, like a light in the attic just came on. And you're allowing yourself to notice that you're worthy enough to be in a state of perpetual peace. Now, this is an inside job because no one else can say that for you or do that for you. And this is where all enlightened teachers have pointed towards the fact that there is no problem. That's what they say. There's no problem because there isn't. You're already at one. The ego is the part of us that creates the problems or perceives the problems. But the truth of us is an always constant alignment with the divine. So here, how do you get to, how do you get this? By letting go of thoughts that aren't aligned with this. How? By changing your mind about your purpose. Step one, this is your purpose. And this is what's going to get you to stay perpetually enlightened. You came here to be happy. You came here to be happy. Think of any enlightened person that's truly enlightened, and you're going to see somebody who's core deep happy. Why? They get it. They get the fact that they can relax. The one who relaxes the most wins. How easy is this? You do nothing other than be who you truly are and just don't do the rest. Let life take care of itself because it will. We're not in this crazy world of mayhem that's, that's real. The reality is if each and every one of us decided to be perpetually peaceful and infinitely happy as their personal goal, then all of us would live in a state of constant inspiration to evolve this place to be the most wonderful place to be. But because we think we're going to find it out there, instead of owning that it's already in here, that's where we all slip up. 
So you came here to be happy. That's step number one. How do you maintain happiness? Think one happy thought after another. One happy thought after another. What does that look like? Non-judgmental appreciation. Really let that sink in. What does happiness look like? Non-judgmental appreciation. You get it that we have diversity for a reason. We have this and that for a reason. We have all of that so that we can show up with non-judgmental appreciation, full embrace, and anything that seems out of alignment with peace, we just kind of tweak it lovingly and watch how things start to move into a state of absolute heaven on earth. So how do you stay perpetually non-judgmental? These are all questions one after the other that came in my meditation. You realize everything is a work in progress. That's why we have time and space to watch everything evolve. If we didn't have time and space, everything would just be and is. It's all is. But with time and space, we spread it out so that we can watch things evolve. And so as we're here co-creating and evolving this place to an even more amazing capacity of, of expansion through our awareness, we get to co-create with the divine. Very fun, very fun. Makes us feel very happy because we're being proactive and we're part of a solution always. We're the answer. That's what a savior is. I mean, the word savior is a little bit, we don't use it very often. So it's a little bit out there for people to try to embrace for themselves. But truly, in, in A Course in Miracles, where it says you came here to be the savior of the world, well, you came here with full-blown capacity for imagination and connectivity and delight and this non-judgmental appreciation. That's a savior. That's what it looks like. When you show up into any situation, no matter how crazy and chaotic you be, and you show up with full-blown attentiveness and awareness and appreciation, and all that takes is for you to step back and let the divine of you come forward, the light of you come forward. And it's like where it used to be dark, all of a sudden it's light because the light of you, that divinity of you, that enlightened being of you comes forward to light it up to co-create with you. But this is the best use of a human body to show up letting your divinity lead the way so that you show up as the solution, as the in quotes savior. So you realize everything is a work in progress. That's how you stay perpetually non-judgmental. That's why we have time and space to watch everything evolve. And everything, you know, everything is always evolving. Now, where's the despair in that? If everything's always evolving, and now there's a mess in front of your face, but you see that as part of the creative process, and you know you can co-create with the divine, you know you can co-join with the divine and have this enlightened mind that can go in and be able to see everything is evolving. So I'm going to evolve this to a better state of being. That's not fixing or trying to manipulate anybody or anything. That's the ego's territory. That's embracing someone and something fully enough to be able to have them feel safe and sound and secure in your non judgmental mind and in your non judgmental embrace to be able to say, okay, I trust this. Let's go. Here we go. And that allows for people to go into the unknown much more willingly. And then remember that they're saviors too. They have an enlightened aspect of themselves. They have a part of themselves that maybe is dormant because they haven't been believing in themselves, but it's not believing in yourself. It's surrendering to the part of you that's everything. Instead of feeling impotent or scared or lonely or any of those things that an ego begets in us. We start to relax and sit back and say, oh, I get it. There's a solution to every problem. Oh, wait a minute. I'm it? I'm it? Actually, that's what an enlightened being says. Problem? Solution. 
point out to the world, see something that could look problematic. Eh, not such a big deal. Why? Because I'm the solution. And guess what? One person connected to the divine is more powerful than a thousand, 10,000 people who are disconnected. And if you're truly connected, you feel it and you know it. And the, the timing is perfect and the inspiration is spot on. And the delivery is right there at a, in full embrace. And that is what heals this planet. So since it's ever evolving and everything is always evolving, it always will be. That's the nature of the eternal or it wouldn't be eternal. It's ever going to evolve, but there's no end to this. So there's no finite, I'm done disaster. There's an evolving situation always. You always have a continual opportunity to evolve it. Never done. Never done. So that's perfect because if there's a situation that needs mending, guess who's here? If you notice it, then that means you have the capacity, maybe not to jump in egotistically to fix it, obviously not, or most things would be getting a lot more cleaned up a lot more quickly. But that's because we haven't yet learned as a collective, as a human collective, to say, okay, bigger the mess, the more connected I better be. Bigger the mess, the more I got to go into silence for a little while, people. See ya. Did you ever notice this, like in the parables about Jesus, the crowds forming, and they're on the shore? What does he do? He gets back in the boat and leaves. Or the crowd's forming. Where does he go? He takes off and goes to the desert. That wasn't because he was being antisocial. That was because he knew his way to be enlightened was to get with himself in perfect peace and be in a place where he doesn't give until he's received first, very eloquently and absolutely, till he can feel like, just like this, best buds with the divine. At one, my father and I are one, the divine and I are one. That's enlightenment. But that's everybody and any enlightened being, any truly enlightened being on the planet is going to say the exact same thing. Hey, we're all enlightened. You just don't know it. And the only reason you don't know it is because you've been paying more attention to the ego, the voice of separation that keeps telling you you're separate from who you truly are. But just come with me, relax a little bit, smile a little bit, get the joke. It's only a joke. Can't be real. You can't usurp the divine and the divine says you're perfect and you're all love and you're at one and I'm never letting you go. And so happily just surrender to that. Now the ego comes kicking and screaming. This is the process of arriving at enlightenment. The ego sometimes comes kicking and screaming because from the time that we're small, we're conditioned to believe that we're this separate self. And so there's been this really important mission to keep this self safe and to keep this self something important enough to, to matter. And the reason why I feel this, the reason why that's so important to an ego is because somewhere inside it knows it's like the, the finger in the dike, that there's this massive, powerful being that it's trying to usurp. And it's small and pitiful and separate. It has lots of tactics and lots of things that it thinks are smart and ways to manipulate. But in light of what it's looking at, the infinite and the, the power that creates everything, it's trying to hold back that. Good luck. So the good news of that story is we're all ultimately going to arrive. And it doesn't matter how many gyrations and how many iterations of this story of separation you can come up with. We're very creative. We're, our, we're begotten by the, the absolute creator. So the more you insist on having a temper tantrum, this is a quote from A Course in Miracles, you're in a perpetual temper tantrum in which you say you want it thus. And the temper tantrum is against the divine. 
Like, I don't trust that you're real because you're invisible and I can touch and taste and feel and sense this. And, and I, I wrap my whole world around this. And because this is all I know, sorry, this feels safer to me. But now the wizened one realizes after a time, and, and fortunately, you know, it only is time and space that we're, we're wasting, which is really not that important. The infinite is what is the most important. The infinite's not going anywhere. So ultimately, we're all going to awaken. There's no doubt about that. You know, just leave your human body and you're at one with the divine. So what people imagine is the worst thing that could ever happen is actually only connectivity with the divine. So doesn't that make total sense? Here we are, these unconscious people who are running around in this world of separation, thinking that, well, you know, we'll stir it up and it'll get better. And we keep stirring it up and it gets more chaotic and that's not working. Okay. So we'll try this and we'll rearrange that. And we keep doing all these things that occupy our time and space the whole time we're on planet earth. And then we think, but I'm doing this to avoid death because that's real. And the only one thing that's real is death and taxes. And these sayings like that, that people live by, and then one day they leave their human form and it was like taking off a tight shoe and they realize, what was I thinking? Well, you were thinking, 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 that's the way of the ego instead of being, being, being connected to your true self. The good news and the best news of this is that if you're here, you understand that you're not going to wait until you leave your human body to experience heaven and oneness. That's absolutely not the best path. The best and most powerful path is to just surrender right now and say, you know what? I know the divine is. There's a part of me that absolutely knows with a capital K that the divine is. And now I'm getting the path to get there. This is a continuum. So you're going to be in a place where the dreams will continue. Don't worry about that. You're going to have way more fun. An awakened life, an enlightened life is way more fun because all you're really doing is receiving and appreciating all day, every day and showing up knowing that if there's a problem of any kind, that you are the solution. If you don't believe that, that means that you're egotistically bound at that time. Just relax, sit back, meditate, breathe, and connect. And in the next moment, you're going to know and have the inspiration about how you show up to that in a way that's all embracing and loving and going to evolve that situation that's ever evolving anyway, you just kind of click in into the evolutionary train of things. And you decide that this is going to be a pretty fun life for you because things will always shift and change and morph. And maybe even when you start to surmount smaller obstacles, you might even get to see bigger ones. You know, I was a very fearful person before I woke up, very fearful. And, um, and I would do things like, you know, put on the alarm systems, get the dog at the window and have a pair of scissors under my bed in case somebody came in at night. And then Shortly after I woke up, I found myself working with people in maximum security prisons, like willingly, happily. Some of my most fun days were going into maximum security prison because feel that, feel that. How would I know that I had shifted so dramatically had I not had experiences of things on planet Earth? But I had one experience where here's me in the same physical body, didn't like lift weights to get stronger or do anything, but change my mind and my alignment and my orientation so that in circumstances where before I would have, I would have done anything to avoid that. Now I'm like, sure, I'll go. And, and seeing that as nothing more than infinitely interesting because now the other part of this is that I could no longer see anyone else as not having the potential to awaken no matter where they are or what they've done in life. The only reason that we do anything that's hurtful or harmful to ourselves or others is because we're separate. It's a condition. 
For some people, it's a chronic condition, but it's the same as any other illness. You can heal and get well, but the only way to do that is to relax and let yourself be in the arms of the divine more persistently. Now, at first, it might be that it feels, you know, for me in the very beginning, there were states of, it felt like bliss to me because I had never known such um, effortlessness. I had always been a trier, striver kind of person, work the hardest kind of thing. You know, I had this father that had work, work ethic for days. And so nobody ever sat down in my house when we were little kids. It was like, you sit down, get your ass up and work and do something. And so we really learned to be on constant hyper mode. And then all of a sudden I was being and what that felt like, I'm just going to describe it because I know you've all had windows of it. It felt like when I was grocery shopping, I didn't have the list, my furrowed brow. I didn't have the list in front of me. And I wasn't like, you know, getting this or that and come on, get out of my way. I'm on my way. This is a mission. I got to get home and make dinner. And I had the, the lineup of tasks that were always, you know, perpetually lined up for me. Instead, I was in the grocery store and I'm marveling at how did all this stuff get on these shelves? Like what? This came from that country and this country. And it's like, I can just pick this up. And I, this is amazing. And I'm marveling at the fact that I totally missed this for how many years before this that I'd gone shopping. And so what happened is the experience was opening my heart where it had been cemented before self-protected, really always needing to be in control and in charge. And now here I am, there's only one thing that's in control now, and it's my resonance with peace. I'm just on this peace train, walking around the supermarket. And it started to feel as though my heart was exploding with joy. And that was a new experience for me. I will say that that's a very common experience in the in the world and land of enlightenment because the divine gives the divine doesn't need anything the divinity of us just gives so as someone who thinks that we're separate when you start receiving from the divine and it just perpetually gives its infinite love infinitely appreciative of you when did you ever experience that on earth and it's, it's walking around in your human body. And it's you in relationship to you. And it's not contingent on anyone else's good or bad opinion or anyone else's thoughts or feelings. You're walking around in a state of grace. Now feel it, a state of grace you don't work for. You receive you allow yourself to be in that place where you're just 100% like an antenna. You're still, you're, you're completely, completely complete in the fact that you can receive completion and all you're doing is being one big antenna. And then as you walk into life, you're broadcasting that as as love and appreciation for everything you see, because it becomes too captivating to want to wanna leave it. Now, again, I don't want to make this enlightenment be something unattainable because then people sometimes will fall off a wagon once in a while. They'll fall off and that's okay because through the contrast, we see that this is even more valuable. And if you, if you don't have a contrast, sometimes you don't really know, whoa, this is, this is all I want. And so the people who are more often in that state are people who just get it that any time I've ever chosen. So after that state of, of, of contrast from where I was to where I, the, you know, overnight shifted to where I was completely different. And my orientation was like, yeah, cool. Maximum security prison. Who are you, Maureen? Oh, I'll tell you who I am. I'm the savior of the world. <laughs> and now would I ever say that out loud to people? Absolutely not. And I'm certainly not going to say that walking into a maximum security prison e either. But that was my inner orientation. I'm giving you the secret to enlightenment. 
that if you want to stay perpetually awake, it means you have to know that if there's a challenge out there, you're the answer, you're the solution. So that anytime someone comes at you in a bad mood or a mean, bad person, well, that's okay because I'm the solution. So what does the solution do when somebody comes and starts you know, yelling in your face? They either smile and show that there's another way or they peacefully stay peaceful and show that there's another way. And, and by the way, you're so connected and committed to this truth of who you are, that whatever they do, it doesn't really matter anyway. And then the more dramatic their call for love, the more that you're just going to say, well, the only answer here, the only sane solution is love. So come on, here I am, me and my one divine self, that's all love. And if I feel I can't do it, then that's just my ego pretending I'm somebody that I'm not. And I've had enough of that in this experience of life to know that that doesn't work for me. And it's going to tell me the only solution is to judge or to fight back or to do something that's very small minded and defensive instead of what the divine says is, you know what? Here's what the divine would say to me, Maureen, guess what? I'm going to tell you a little secret. Everybody's always doing the best they can. You know, it might be miserable. That might be as far as they've gotten on their path towards self-love. They might really loathe themselves in this moment. That's not your business. That's between them and them. But everybody's always doing the best they can. And if you know that, if you truly believe that, then your best might be different than theirs right now. You know how to relax more. That's, all, that's the only asset that you have going for you. You're just relaxing more. You're just letting me take charge here. I'm all love. I don't need anything. I'm not going to have an agenda. And when you let go to that, you start to see, oh yeah, everybody was always doing the best they can. It's hard being humans that don't like themselves. It's hard having an identity that thinks that you're small and that you came here to get something that you can't find because you brought it with you and you're dismissing it. Feel how that's such a recipe for self-loathing. Part of you knows I'm missing something. What am I missing? Well, you're missing that you're the savior of the world and you're divine. And there's an enlightened part of you that's always here and never going to go anywhere. And you're missing that? That's not small potatoes. That's like everything. And so, of course, it's frustrating. And of course, people are angry with themselves. And of, of course, People feel self-loathing. So just letting yourself relax in a way that you say, okay, I know everybody's doing the best they can. It's not my business anyway. All I'm doing is showing up to opportunity after opportunity. The more dysfunctional it is, the more of a mess it is. Well, great. I always have a playground. And if this is okay, because no one can even die. That's not the truth of this. We're perpetually eternal. And the only thing we find when we release ourselves from these bodies is peace and oneness and the love that we always wish we knew. But that's the point of being enlightened here on earth is to bring this now and to let yourself release and surrender to this place. So back to what I wrote this afternoon. Um, so it's never finite. It's never done. You always have a continual opportunity to evolve it. So it's perfect because you are the solution. You are the savior. You came here to evolve it. And if you feel, oh, that's confusing. I don't even have like high self-esteem. I don't even know how to, then just relax because that means you're at the, that moment feeling confused and the separate self has you under its arm and under its wing, trying to keep you safe with its way of being. Just take a big, deep breath, recenter yourself, and then just say, this is a perfect prayer. I'm here. I'm willing. I'm, I'm willing. And you're saying this to your divine self who knows everything about you, knows how to best embrace you and bring you into the truth of who you are without 
promoting more fear or angst or any of that. It knows how to bring you home. And all you have to say is, I'm willing and I'm ready. I do understand just from my own experience that that was a scary thought because to me, it was unknown. I didn't know God at the time. My awakening experience had me in the arms and the heart of God. So I now knew God. So I wasn't afraid any longer of being at one with the divine. Um, you know, I'm just going to do a little sidetrack here. And there's a path, the yogic path of enlightenment is, is laid out in a book that was written in, they don't know either the first or second century BC. And uh, it was from a sage whose name was Patanjali. And there's all kinds of uh, stories or, and mythology around Patanjali that, you know, Shiva was um, asked to bring in a teacher that would help people to awaken. And this person, this sage became the embodiment of that teacher. And so um, the yoga sutras are what Patanjali wrote. And, and this is the path of the yogic tradition that helps people walk up to the enlightenment. And what it sees enlightenment as the epitome of enlightenment is a still mind. Now feel what we've been talking about. A still mind can be all embracing to stillness and the absolute without having any gyrations to color it or to make you feel separate from it. A still mind is, is able to merge with oneness. And so there are all these things, and this is a good version. It's called How to Know God. Um, that's, there's a few translations, you know, it's in Sanskrit. So the translations that I like the most, there are three different ones. One is by um, Shivananda. And that's a, it's a, these are real nice graspable translations. But this one, How to Know God, was written by Swami Pravananda and Christopher Isherwood, you know who Christopher Isherwood is? I find this really interesting. He's the person in the 1940s who wrote the, the play, I Am a Camera, that became um, Cabaret. And the, the, the movie and the show Cabaret. And so here he was, someone who was a writer and wrote things about Berlin and, and during the time frame pre-World War II, and I think World War II, he has some other books. And then he became a uh, disciple of Swami Pravananda and wrote this How to Know God, but he's a wonderful writer. And you can see, you know, just from like, think about it. I love just the thought that the person who wrote this How to Know God also wrote the makings of Cabaret and, and was one of the first openly gay artists at, at his, in his time. So it was like, what a, what a bright being choosing to be more aligned with a path that was uniquely his and being able to connect in a way that allowed for him to expand awareness and consciousness. So that's one of the yogic paths. But now back to this, what I wrote today. So um, you always have a continual opportunity to evolve everything. So that's perfect. So the only sane mantra or life motto is if you ever feel an egotistically driven urge to judge, meaning that you feel separate from it and therefore see it as finite. So anything that you choose to judge, think about that. The only reason you judge it is because you think it's stuck. You think it's finite, that that's the only thing it could be, any person, place, or thing. And so you judge it into finiteness. And when we do that, we realize that just dismantled our creative capacity that just dismantled our capacity to evolve the situation. If everything's infinite and we never get it done, how can it possibly be finite? So all judgment is wrong. I'm gonna make a blanket statement. That was the one liberating thought that allowed for me to stay in a perpetual state of connectivity to the divine. I realized that I had been chronically judging my entire life, which is what most of us are taught from the time that we are of the age of reason, in quotes. Think about it, small kids just don't know how to judge. I remember one time, I must've been about five years old. So they say like seven years old is the age of reason where we are supposed to teach kids how to judge and to keep them safe. 
But I remember being about five years old and there was a, one of those shows that was on, on like a Sunday night that family watch, I don't know what it was, maybe Ed Sullivan, something like that. And there was a singer that was on it. And when he came on, he started singing. And I remember my father saying, I hate that guy's voice. That guy's awful. And I remember watching it and thinking, how does he know? How, how does he know that that, I, I mean, like, I thought if anybody sang, it was like, a song and it was great because you sing when you're happy or you sing when I had no idea how to discern and I remember that stuck with me because I wanted to know how do I know if something is good or bad and how interesting that at that time when we're that young and capable of absolute appreciation and innocence that then we grow up to be able to discern things, but look how much of our discernment is imprisoning because it's based on judgment. And, and when we don't, in quotes, judge correctly, then we're judging ourselves and having guilt. Guilt is judgment turned inward. So we're in a perpetual state of separation because judgment is saying something's finite, something's broken, something's wrong. And we give that the authority, that perception, the authority, instead of saying, wait a minute, everybody's doing the best they can. Let's take it back. Let's go connect with our divine self. Let's go meditate. Let's go breathe. Oh, okay. I get it. That's an opportunity to evolve it. That's an opportunity to choose love when everybody else is choosing fear, the finite fear, and instead choose the infinite love. So here we are back to this again. So the only sane mantra or life motto is if you ever feel an egotistically driven urge to judge, meaning you feel separate from it and therefore see it as finite, the only solution is to join with it non-judgmentally by saying, I'm going to give you my favorite mantra that I got told one day from the divine. The way to join with something, if you feel judgment towards it, is to use this mantra by saying, I don't know what it is, but I love it. I love this mantra because if you say, I don't know what it is, but I love it, you're opening your mind. I don't know what it is. So you haven't judged it. You're letting it be something possibly that you never saw before. But I love it merges you with the divine right away. The divine is all love. So I don't know what this is, but I love it. All of a sudden now you've just stepped back into divine perspective. Now the divine can view it for you, can allow for you to see it differently, can allow for you to see it in a way that you instantaneously start to appreciate it. And when you appreciate it, then you have the power to evolve it. It's crazy amazing that you can just say about anything at all that's disturbing to you or upsetting to you. I don't know what this is because literally you really don't. You don't know what it has the makings to be. You don't know what and why and how someone might be saying or doing something they're, they're, they're doing just because they are thinking of something in the past or disconnected in some way that you're not aware of. I don't know what this is, but I love it. And that then is the most enlightening statement. It will have you default to love. Remember, enlightenment is a state of absolute appreciation and perpetual peace because now all you're doing is choosing love. And when you choose love, there's this feeling of, I, I don't, I'm, I'm reconnecting to something that's vital for me. I'm, I'm now allowing myself not to have this part of me that needs to be the authority for me and tell me what to do and how to do it to stay safe. And it's largely based on judgment or guilt. Now you're giving that up willingly and you're letting yourself say, here I am, here I am. Tell me what you will for me. 
And then don't be surprised when you become the savior of the situation or the answer or the healer or the solution. If the savior is a little too much to handle, then the, the solution, the remedy, the answer. And believe me, that's a state of peace and that's a state of satisfaction moving from satisfaction to satisfaction to satisfaction. This is a state of enlightenment. It's a state of connectivity to what the divine has always wanted for us and what we have always wanted for ourselves, but now we're allowing it and we're accepting it. So once you love it with this kind of open mind, you realize you can evolve the situation quite easily because you've joined with it. You're one with it instead of in opposition to it. When you judge it, when you are guilty, you're disconnected from it. It's a sure sign. Judgment is a sure sign that you have to see it as separate from you to be able to judge it. Now you become one with it because I don't know what this is, but I love it. Now you love it. And because of that, you've joined it and you're one with it instead of in opposition to it. No push, pull, push, pull, just a flow in the direction you most love and desire it to go. Now you are a conscious evolutionary. That's what enlightenment is about. You're conscious that there's another way. I don't know what this is, but I love it. You don't even have to know what the other way is. You just know that love is the way. And then knowing that you can show up to something that you're embracing rather than judging, it gives you the power and the capacity to evolve it. This is how your visionary self takes over. And this is how you own the co-creative capacity that you have. You allow yourself then to take your eyes off the world as, as the most captivating experience that you have. And instead, the other thing that's, that this affords you, which is so beautiful and so amazing, is you have time and space because this crazy time and space bound world starts to not be as important to you. And so you take back your own time and space to abide with yourself and with your divine self. And what happens then is you get a much clearer connection, like a deeper connection from the heart down, gut core connection, heart connection, not all in your head, always fluttery and flighty and changing your mind about things. This deeper resonance with what truly feels satisfying for you, with, with your life's purpose, actually. Things that you know that, you know, you might be an artist, but somewhere along the line, somebody said something in fifth grade and you never picked up a paintbrush again, or you knew that there was this thing that captivated you always and you wanted to explore, but you never had the time or the space because you were so busy, occupied with the world. Now you're in this space where you know silence speaks and you're connected to allness that only has your best interest in mind. It's the voice of your own best interest. And it knows you impeccably, knows you with a capital K. And now that's where you're getting your directive from. It, it only actually opens wide space within you, a place of absolute receptivity, so that then you can sink down into it and then you have a desire and then you ask from that place of connectivity, knowing that the divine is on it, like on it, instantaneously on it. Now you are connected to the divine and you're having these ideas and thoughts about what you want to experience in your future. And it feels like this is between you and the divine, this little inside joke and fun endeavor and relationship. And then it's like you've planted seeds. You're not going to pick them up and look at them to make sure they're growing. You just let them stay in the soft soil, knowing that with your enthusiasm and your delight and your happy thoughts, you're watering the ground and they're going to, they're going to spring up. And 
the thing about this is that you more resonate with being surprised and delighted because you understand that the divine wants to surprise and delight you. That's one of its favorite things. Really wants you to be surprised. Miracles are surprises and delights. They come in vertical insertions into a horizontal world. And when you start to get used to having miracles pave your way, they become a little addicting in the best way because you realize that you don't have to work hard. You don't want to work hard. You don't want to be the one that, you know, can work so hard to get this for what? Instead, you let yourself connect and then deeply go inside to this place where this beautiful desires that you came here to live and experience and to bring to life arise from. And then you co-join with the divine to bring them to life. And pretty soon the disasters and the problems and the challenges kind of like just fade into this really non-important background. And that's what it feels like to walk on an enlightened path. You feel absolutely connected in that you're stepping back and letting the divine lead the way. The divine is light, all light, love, all love. So what's paving your path is light, all light, and love, all love. It already absolutely knows what makes you the most satisfied and happy and delighted in life. And its number one priority is to bring that to you. It's not an ego. An ego is the one that says, work hard, try hard, you're separate, you'll never be good enough. The divine, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. It says, you're perfect, you're perfection. Thank you for arriving. Thank you for being the love of my life. And you can do anything. And I'm here to support you in that. Feel the difference in fulfillment there. So here we are. Once you love it, after you say, I don't know what it is, but I love it. Once you love it with this kind of open mind, you realize you can evolve the situation quite easily because you've joined it. You're one with it instead of in an opposition to it. No push, pull, push, pull, just a flow in the direction you most love or desire it to go. Now you are a conscious evolutionary, conscious of how to evolve anything, anything, all caps I wrote. <laughs> you love it. Join with it and envision it forward. Life happens now moving forward. That's why you can't drag a past into your future easily. Too much baggage to carry along, slowing you down, having you constantly look back needlessly. The past is over. It can touch me not. So what you realize is that what happens now is that you become very present because you realize that it's in this present moment, your thoughts and your feelings and your desires are creating your future. Not your past, the past is over. In A Course in Miracles, it says the past is over, it can touch me not. That's a quote, direct quote. Past is over, yeah, it's just a thought in your mind. Now you can carry that baggage forward, but it's gonna slow you down. So instead of carrying forward any baggage from the past, you allow yourself to do the one thing that really promotes enlightenment. It's one of the fast ways to get to enlightenment. Forgive it. Forgive it and forget it. Forgive it and forget it. Everybody was always doing the best they could. Everything was always at its peak of how it could evolve. And now we're evolving it further. And let yourself know that from this moment on, there's an and then there's this to the story. It's never finite. Remember, you came here to evolve this place. So if it was a mess, a hot mess, doesn't matter because that's the past. It's only baggage now. If you bring it forward, the only thing you want to bring forward from the past is the lessons learned and the insights you've gained while you're allowing yourself to say, well, that sucked. I don't want to do that again. And so you don't have to. And then you say, I don't know what that was, but I love it. So I love that I, that happened and is over and it's in the past. It can touch me not. And now in this moment, my connectivity to the divine, my ability to be surprised and delighted without having to manipulate or control my life, the, my ability to the one who relaxes the most wins, surrender and let the divine lead the way, to connect in the place where I let these beautiful core felt desires percolate and well up, 
now I can look forward to a future where everything's going to be coming up roses because I'm bringing the perception of connectivity. And if it doesn't seem so happy, I have my mantra. I don't know what it is, but I love it. So the future is happy if you decide to be happy no matter what. Now feel it. How is that possible? The future is happy if you decide to be happy no matter what. Feel that. How is that possible? There's only one way. You change your identity. The thing that made you unhappy before is that you thought you were a hot mess and that's all you were. You forgot that that's the ego's version of separation from who you really are. There is an enlightened being inside you. It's already there. It remembers. And it knows you and loves you impeccably. And all it ever wants you to do is unite with it so that it can make your life super easy, delightful, miraculous, and fun. And all it ever wants is your perfect happiness. So the future is happy if you decide to be happy no matter what. When you're happy, that's an indication that you're connected, by the way. If you want to know whether you're connected or disconnected, when you feel peaceful, when you feel happy, when you feel satisfied, that's when you're connected. It's not because somebody else said something that's satisfying or thinks of you in a good way. That's the outside need to see approval or situations as the impetus for your happiness. This is different. You, you choose to be who you are in a way that this is the only priority is that you're contented and satisfied. And then if you start to go off that path and you realize, what am I doing? Like I was happy this morning and then all of a sudden I got unhappy. What, did, what just happened here? Oh, I see. I was caring about what he or she thought. And I went down on their agenda. I've been conditioned for that my whole life. And guess what? I've never been happy. And instead, now I decide to say, you know what? Can you make me your last resort? I, I have other things that are important to me today that guess what? You know, I have to say this out loud, but they're much more peaceful. And I'm choosing peace and that's my priority now. So if you can make me your last resort, that will be wonderful. And guess what? You'll find that because we're one, and this is a challenging concept to grasp at first, I just couldn't believe it. It blew my mind in the beginning. That when I chose peace, absolutely with commitment, then other people actually were more peaceful in my relate in relationship with me. So how that looks is that you say something like, um, okay, I have 10 minutes and I have to get to the store and I have to get home and I have to do blah, 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 blah for all these. And then instead you say, okay, I'm just going to follow the voice of peace. And the voice of peace says, no, don't go to the store. You don't need to get that thing. You're, you just relax here and do this. And then, you know, so what, you don't have the cake for when your people, your friends come to visit. That's okay. It, you're just more peaceful staying home. Your friends arrive. Surprise. We brought a cake. And that's the way it works. I promise you, I promise you that the day that it hit home for me was when I was rushing. I would have rushed to get home from working in Boston. And I lived north of Boston about 45 minutes because my kids were small. And I thought that I had to pick up my daughter in time for school. The teacher's going to be mad and she's going to be afraid. She's waiting for me. I'm late. There's traffic. And normally I would have been giving everyone the finger on the way and pushing with the gas pedal to get me there faster. And instead, I just took a deep breath and realized one body, one place you can be at one time. Just take it easy, relax. You'll get there in the perfect timing. If you're peaceful, it's all going to be good. And believe me, that was not my way of being for this. Well, the enlightened way is to perpetually choose peace. And when I got to pick up my daughter about almost an hour late, the only other person on the playground with her was her best friend who she never got a chance to spend time with. And her mother was late and she was never late either. And so I got a chance to watch the, the two of them delighted skipping off to meet her mother who was behind me in the car at the same time. And I said, wow, is that how this works? 
Well, in the dream of oneness, enlightenment, you realize that everything that's unsettling or problematic is a dream of separation. And every time you choose peace, you're in alignment with the divine that's way bigger and more capable than a little tiny separate ego and can orchestrate everything in your best interest in ways that are surprisingly and delightfully peaceful. So let go. You're not gaining anything by allowing the ego to run your world. Choose peace persistently and you're choosing enlightenment. Okay. So the, now the future is happy. If you decide to be happy, no matter what now feel it, how is that possible? Only one way you change your identity. You are the savior of the world. If you really truly adopt that identity, you see that it's not arrogant at all. It's anything but arrogant. You literally arrive to make anything and everything better. That's what your purpose is. You realize that if it's a, it's a problematic situation, well, here I come. Blissfully, delightfully, you know, could look dumb and unaware, but you're connected to absolute wisdom, absolute impeccable timing, absolute peace and well-being that has everyone's best interest in mind. The only priority of the divinity of you is win-win. Win-win. That's why I show up after staying peaceful. And there's my daughter skipping and happy to have spent time with her best friend. It's a win-win world when you're connected to the divine. You literally arrive to make anything and everything better. How? Through your appreciation. You appreciate you appreciate it if it's wonderful. And more importantly, you appreciate it if it's a hot mess. You save it, Savior. You save it, Savior. How? By loving it unconditionally. That's the answer. Unconditionally. You want to be enlightened? You want to feel yourself as a free spirit? then you have to get unconditional, just like your divinity. It doesn't have a body, doesn't have a limited mind, doesn't have this self that's separate from everyone else. It's unconditional. And if you choose love unconditionally, that's how you save it, Savior. You allow yourself just to be the love that you are. And you know what that feels like? Nothing. It feels like peace. It feels like, uh, you know, um, like you're flowing with water and you're letting yourself float downstream. You're not paddling upstream, you're floating downstream and you're one with the water. And everywhere it flows, it brings grace. And everywhere it goes, it brings renewal. And you're just going along with the flow. So, when you appreciate things, you connect with them, you become one with them. So let me see where I am here now. Um, you save it, Savior. How? By loving it unconditionally. That means despite any preconceived notions or conditions. Why and how? Because you know if you love it, it will respond. If you love it unconditionally, it will morph and it will change. That's that's something that, again, the more you experience this, the more you are capable of staying in an enlightened state because it's captivating. When you thought before that if you judge something, you're going to fix it because you're going in all, you know, muscling your way through something to fix it. And then you realize, wait a minute, I missed the whole important part. Unconditionally love it first. Now you're aligned with the power that the powers that be. And anything you do is going to morph it into perfection. So because there's, it's, you've loved it unconditionally, you know if you love it, it will respond. If you love it unconditionally, it will morph and it will change. Why? Because there is nothing, absolutely no thing 
more powerful than love. Why? Because only love is real. I want to make sure you, that you drive that home right now. Only love is real. The way that the Bhagavad Gita opens and the way that the Course in Miracles opens is it says, I'm paraphrasing it because I don't know the exact words, only love is real. Nothing real can be threatened. Herein lies the peace of God. Only love is real. Nothing real can be threatened. Herein lies the peace of God. So if you love it unconditionally, it will morph, it will change. Why? Because there is nothing, absolutely no thing more powerful than love. Why? Only love is real. Nothing real can be threatened. Herein lies the peace of God and the key to enlightenment. Love all unconditionally and you will see love everywhere and know yourself as you truly are, the savior of the world. And by the way, enlightened. You get this? This is a, a big chunk to chew, <laughs> which is good because we have some time and space to do that. But have fun to know that this isn't just something for some, you know, special and exceptional people. They appear, they truly do appear and are exceptional once they become more aligned with the, the, the one being that we all are. But that's the most important thing to know about enlightened people is that they're just living, breathing embodiments and examples of what we're all here to do. In, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you're just like me. And if you don't believe it, I'll wait. And guess what? He's waiting because he has nowhere to go because he's an eternal being already identified at 100% eternal. Yet fun for us that there's also some passages in A Course in Miracles that are further along. And they talk about um, this, I, this experience of oneness with the divine. I'm fortunate enough to have had an experience out of my body and then back into the body enough to be able to remember it this lifetime. All of us will leave the body and, and know this oneness with the divine, but I came back. So I'm able to remember that experience of, of oneness. That's so absolute. You can't speak about it. It's just perfection without any contrast. So when I came back, when everything shifted overnight for me, the contrast was so uh, palpable that I knew the difference of what I was before and what I now could be. I'm still human. There are still human experiences and things that come up in my world, just the way they do in everyone's world. But I basically consistently choose peace. That's my default. And because of that, I've gotten experience after experience after experience where I knew what I would have chosen otherwise. And I knew what that looked like because my past was over, but I remembered what it was. And I knew the dramatic difference was the only thing that had changed was me, not the outside world. Nothing else changed in my world at all. I woke up the next day with small kids the same way I had before and everything was the same, but I changed. And I won't even say I changed. I just let go of the ego that had run my life for so long as the, as the, the only voice of authority that I thought was real. And I now knew that we're all divine and that all we're doing is becoming self realized this is our true self. And it's a big joke. It's a big joke that we could ever be anything but the reality of who we are. So in order to live this life in the most fun and joyful and engaging and perpetually peaceful way, know that, that this is just one big um, really joke that we decided to show up to, that it's not real, that anything that speaks or smacks of separation is just an illusion, as A Course in Miracles would put it. It's just a dream. It's a mad dream of separation. And we can wake up from it at any time. 
we can wake ourselves up most readily and easily by using these tactics of just saying, okay, I don't know what it is, but I love it. Especially when you really, really want to sink your teeth into knowing what it is because you're mad or you're angry or you're in that judgmental state. You can diffuse an ego so quickly by recognizing that you really don't know what it is. It's all work in progress. I used to put it this way, that whenever we're seeing anything that we believe is real and it's disheartening or unsettling, it's like we've just read one word on one line in one sentence, in one paragraph of one page of one chapter of one book that's a book in, of volumes of, in a library. And we think we know the whole story and we judge based on that one little thing that has the capacity to be the entire world. And everything is working in perfect order. I promise you, there is nothing here that is out of order. The more dramatic it is, the more dramatic a wake up call it is, the more dramatic a call for love it is. If you don't like it, then choose to focus on peaceful things that aren't unsettling. If you feel called to it or riveted by it, then know the only way to stay enlightened or peaceful in that circumstance is to know that you're here to be a savior for it. And you'll know because no one is egotistically driven if you're enlightened. <laughs> you're just, it's just two different worlds. So you're not going to feel like, oh, I have to fix this problem or that I have to obsess about this problem. When you still see it a problem, you can't fix it. So when you are aligned with who you are, you'll be inspired. You won't be motivated to grab it and fix it and change it. You'll be inspired to unconditionally love it back to wholeness, to find the sanity that's possible in any situation once you're aligned to the divine. So I think that's everything about this topic that I wanted to touch on. Um, I, I do have some questions here, and I also want to open it up for any questions that anybody else could have. Um, it's it's really important to us for us to remember that we are all of us in a state of enlightenment always. We can't change that or dismantle that or undo that, but we can anesthetize ourselves to the awareness of that by staying perpetually focused on an egotistical orientation of separation and problems and pain. The more we want to wake up, the more just follow these steps. Um, I feel like this is an important one that I'll just make sure I get this, um, the secret to enlightenment, this little thing that I wrote, I'll send it to people as well so that you have this and, and let yourself notice that it's a lot easier than it appears to be. Um, the only thing that won't find this easy at all is the ego. <laughs> it will annihilate your ego. It will destroy your ego. Instead, you'll find this person emerging that's just happy-go-lucky, delightful, optimistic by nature, and perpetually oriented towards peace. And who wouldn't want to be experiencing that? super fun. I will tell you from my own personal firsthand experience, the dramatic shift that I've lived in this one lifetime from being that um, crazy, obsessive, uh, challenged, uh, fearful, and separate person to being someone who largely just chooses peace. And that's really pretty much the whole story. <laughs> Everything else just happens. In, and also in a wonderful way where it starts to feel like you're watching a movie that is captivating and you're aware that there's uh, more to it. When I'd say when we're asleep, it's more like you're sitting in front of a, a movie screen and you're believing every bit about the movie and you're just like so intense that you can feel your hearts jumping and you can feel your stomach churning and you and then someone comes and, and points at the screen and says, do you realize this is a movie? Look, I'm touching the screen right now. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait a minute. I'm not as captivated by this experience as I was before. 
because this is all a dream and there's a lot more going on outside of the dream than there is inside this dream. All of the divine realm is outside of this dream of separation. And its only agenda is to wake you up to perfect happiness and to keep you in a perpetual state of joy and peace. So question here, number one question I have, does becoming enlightened put an end to the spiritual journey? I would say far, far, far from it. It's like this now co-joined experience where instead of feeling separate and like dropped and lost and confused and in pain, and the journey is always like, oh, okay, I'll slog along and I'll meditate to get myself peaceful or I'll do these things where, you know, I was on a spiritual journey of sorts long before I woke up and I was doing the lessons of A Course in Miracles concertedly for um, two and a half, three years. Bef and, and really feeling challenged by this, by the way, I was not good at, at those lessons. It said, you know, be the light of the world. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I couldn't get through 10 minutes without wanting to curse somebody out or feel frustrated or do all these things. So that I would consider a spiritual path for most people where you're trying the best you can. And it feels like, um, there, there are dips and rises and you can feel disheartened and you can feel like you're doing it. And then all of a sudden the bottom falls out and you don't feel like you're getting anywhere because you're not getting anywhere. You're surrendering and relaxing. And for a person like me who didn't know how to relax, I'd get in the car and like my hand would be clenched like a fist. And if anybody was in the car, they'd be like, Hey, you know, like relax. I didn't even know I was tense. That's how it was for me. So even though I was on a, a spiritual path where I was doing the lessons of A Course in Miracles and learning how to meditate and things like that, I, I didn't feel any deep satisfaction except for little glimpses of peace and awareness. And when I choose differently, I'd see, oh, there is another option or there is another way. But this question, does becoming enlightened put an end to the spiritual journey? No, as long as we're here in a human form, we have enough of an ego to keep us in human form, to keep us being able to see a this and that, and to be able to touch and feel and communicate and relate to other people. It actually is the beginning of a spiritual journey in that your perception now has shifted in that you know you're the savior of the world. And again, I'm going to make that a little bit more accessible by saying the solution to the problem, the healer, the healer that comes in at the right time. You're the miracle worker. You're the miracle being that allows for yourself to be who you truly are. An anomaly for the most part on planet Earth, because most people are not being who they truly are. So. It's where you are allowing yourself to experience this state of equanimity and peace consistently without apologizing for it and not trying to change yourself for anybody else's good or bad opinions. It's an exceptional part of the spiritual journey. It's what we all want to live. And there's a place in A Course in Miracles where it talks about this experience of awakening, where it says that on your way to experiencing full out oneness with God, you will experience the happy dream. You were in a nightmare because you thought you were separate and you thought all this chaos and confusion of the world was real. Now you're in a happy dream. And I would say that enlightenment, while you're still maintaining a physical body, is when you know you're a human at the ready to help in any situation. And it's not you from an egotistical standpoint helping. It's you stepping back and letting the divine lead the way. And you just so happen to have the eyes and the ears and the hands and the feet to take you there in human form. There'll be other beings that'll also support humans on their journeys, whether they feel they're on a spiritual path or not. And there'll be the angelic realms or the beings that we, you know, only wish and hope are real. Well, they are. Everything you ever wished was real truly is. And everything you wished wasn't real isn't. There truly is no death. And there's truly no place of perpetual pain. 
And in this life, we all have an enlightened and aware being that's ready to rise to the surface. It's like becoming the sunrise. One time I've been writing for many, many years, a book for women. And uh, in it, in the beginning of it, when I first started listening to the divine telling me the things and the messages that women most needed to hear, this was the message that I got. Tell them they're as perfect as a sunrise. But when they know who they truly are, they will see they are as brilliant as 10,000 suns. And that's the message that I'd give to anyone who wants to know what this is about this path, the spiritual path of enlightenment. You're as brilliant as a sunrise and perfect as a sunrise, no matter what you think, no matter how much the ego is manipulating and controlling and running your life. But when you truly know who you truly are, you'll see that you're as brilliant as 10,000 suns. And that's what we're here to be, to transcend any idea of separation while we're still in this human body. What a hoot. What an amazing experience. What a life. And that's what is here for you. If you're here and listening to me, then this is for you. Okay, I got another question here. I'm getting old. I'm getting tired. I've been a spiritual seeker for 40 years. I want to be enlightened now. Help. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of help right off the bat. If you think you're getting old and you feel like you're getting tired, then that would be you feeling separate from your true self. You're eternal. That means you're eternally youthful. That means you're eternally awake and aware. When you're feeling old and feeling tired, you're more resonant with the self that's separate. That means that you're going at this too hard. I got to tell you, relax. Because when you relax, you're going to be able to, in quotes, attain everything that you've been working so hard for. You put in the time. You put it in 40 years of being a spiritual seeker. I'm sure you've read thousands of books. I'm sure you've heard lots of inspiring talks. I'm sure you've heard everything there is to say about enlightenment. Just relax. The one who relaxes the most wins. Just relax, because when you relax, all you're doing is letting yourself just step back into the arms of the divine. You will be caught. You will be caught. And the only thing that all that hard work and all that tiring and exhausting experience has, has perpetuated in you is that you think you're not worthy. Don't work so hard. Please, please, please don't work so hard. Let yourself be at ease. Let yourself find the things about yourself you love. Let yourself move from satisfaction to satisfaction to satisfaction. Let yourself realize that being happy should be your main priority. It's how you'll know you're connected to the divine. You'll just feel happy. Because no matter what you're doing, whether you just found a pencil on the ground, it's hot, makes you happy. You're going to know then that that's 99.9% .9 of it. I am saying that because there's an important part here. It's my experience. And so I know that we can do 99% of a spiritual path to awakening and to enlightening uh, ourselves. And then the 1%, the most important percent, the divine carries us. So you have to let go. Because the reason why that is, is that the divine carries us. It's not just because this, this selective divine that wants to make sure you're okay and that you're worthy. It's because if we walked ourselves up to the door of heaven and then walked right in, guess who would think they were in charge of that? The ego. And because you can only do so much and the final step is surrender, now you can get it. I need do nothing. Relax, relax. The one who relaxes the most wins. You wanna get there faster, relax more. Choose happy thoughts, do happy things. 
Be someone who moves deliberately from satisfaction to satisfaction to satisfaction. Stay satisfied even in the place of not knowing. Stay satisfied even in this place of having been a seeker for 40 years. Just be satisfied now. And the more you allow yourself to relax into a satisfied place, believe me, you're letting yourself fall into divine arms and you will be carried. You will be carried. Great question. And I like the candid nature of that too. Um, let's just see this one. One more. What does forgiveness have to do with enlightenment? I love this question and I'm really happy it came because I haven't really addressed this very much just briefly in, in the talk. Forgiveness is really the fast route to falling into the arms of the divine. When we forgive the outside world, essentially the, the path of forgiveness that A Course in Miracles advocates, which I believe is truly the only forgiveness, it's not about saying, oh, you did wrong to me and now I forgive you because I'm a better person. Still very separating. Can you feel that? There's still this us and them. If you're in the place where you realize that had you been connected all along, had you prioritized peace all along, then you would show up a lot differently to anything that you show up in the outside world to. Had you known you were the savior of the world all along, then you wouldn't have seen that terrible, awful assault as an assault. You'd see, oh, I can teach them another way. I can teach them peace. I can be aligned with peace. So you realize that anything that you have to forgive in the world, any grievances, any and disgruntled things, any things that have hurt or harmed you was only because you were disconnected first and then set your vision. Like most people do on the outside world, you walked into a challenging situation because you were separate to begin with. And you perceived it as a challenge and a problem because you were separate as you were perceiving it. But if you were connected to your divinity, your divinity would say, oh, another dramatic call for love. What do you do with a dramatic call for love? Well, only one answer, you love it. And when you show up as love, there's nothing to forgive. The divinity of you never needs to forgive because it stays in an absolute state of perpetual awareness of everyone's perfection. So there's nothing to forgive. If you're unaware of your own perfection and you cause drama and chaos in the world, that's different. The divine says, well, I can see how they would think that because they're believing they're human and separate and in a body. That's pretty frightening and hard. So all the divine ever has is absolute appreciation for us and stays in that place of absolute appreciation, not even acknowledging anything but our perfection. So how could it ever need to forgive us? It doesn't see us as anything but perfect. And then when we begin to mirror the divine for other people and show up as that embodiment of that kind of connectivity to perfection, all of a sudden things change and morph. And I can only say again, I only speak from my firsthand experience and it's pretty dramatic. The differences between when you show up with an agenda and feeling separate and feeling awful or feeling sad or hurt or disconnected, you're gonna see a lot of things that aren't fun and that aren't happy. But when you show up to anything, no matter how dysfunctional or crazy it is, I've been counseling people for 26 years now in the most down and dirty, dysfunctional, disheartening situations. That's what comes to me. And I will tell you, there's only one way I could do that. And that's by staying absolutely 100% perpetually connected to the divine so that I see the perfection of the situation. I can see them out the other side. I can see the fast route right through the bullet train to peace. And I just say, hey, I'm gonna narrate this for you. Do what I say if I'm narrating this, it's gonna take you right to peace as quickly as possible. And then there's nothing to forgive because you realize that it really takes two to tango in the world of separation. You come together and you're gonna to find peace. You keep separate, you're gonna find chaos and confusion. When that happens, you know that you have an option from now on that you can choose peace instead of this. You can choose joy instead of this. You can choose love instead of this, but 
The ego won't do that very easily. It likes to be right rather than happy. The divinity of you, on the other hand, only wants your perfect happiness. It's going to give you the direct route, which is love it now. I don't know what it is, but I love it. Don't believe you know what it is until you love it first. Then you'll go in and guess what, how you'll go in? You'll go in as the savior, as the solution, as the answer. And you will stay perpetually peaceful that way. And you'll stay in a space where you know that there's only light, all light, and that you're choosing that as your path and your path of freedom, joy, peace, and ease. While you're in a body on planet earth, nothing better. Now you're the perfect vehicle to bring peace and joy to all of the other humans that you encounter. And life becomes really amazing and joyful and wonderful perpetually. So you guys, I love you so much. You hung in there and I see you. I see the real you, these bright beaming, beaming spotlight searchlights ready to just be let loose on the world here. And let's do it. Let's just make it a place where everybody can live more peacefully. And if they don't know that they can, we're going to show them that they can and embody it. All right. Big love to everyone. Anyone has anything to say, just unmute yourself. Just enjoy a blissful, blessed week and be the miracle that you are unapologetically. Lots and lots and love to you enlightened, beautiful beings. <laughs> Take care. Bye. <laughs>